So while I'm... Sitting in the chair. Daddy, I want to so, uh, you need to humble yourself. You need to humble yourself. That's what you need to do. Get out of here, buddy. Get out of here. on the mic. Give us a little bit. got three more minutes. we get started. Did you know how long it took Joss to wash this one of your size 17 feet? It took the whole service. You know what I'm saying? So I know you guys are looking at my feet. That bitch needs to be fixed on the other side of her flat. What apples? Stop it. No. No, we're talking about big. No. Just because you feel like that's what I'm going to help you. Alright, we're talking about it. Alright, you guys go sit where you're going to sit and you're going to get started. Go get your snacks. You ready to go? One more minute, we're going to start. Bear with me, I got a little tingle in the throat. Vince prophesied. Vince prophesied what happened. Into the service, she's four. Most of the service, she won't be able to understand. You can't understand. So 
Shalom. Now let's get started. Bear with me. I'm probably going to come up close. My throat is taking it to the next level. It's a sinner. So my singing always goes to like a cocoon phase. And then once it comes back, I was on. I'll be singing like never before. There we go. Let's get it. Now that he's classified. Let's get it. Slow connection. Is this slow connection where I got to move it closer to the router or what? Hear me over there, by the way. You said that the five minutes I loaded up, you should have told me. Welcome, welcome. Appreciate it. Welcome to Trudy United. Let's be some left red day three. Definitely thank the Almighty. He's a normal Sabbath too, so it'll be regular service. Definitely give all honor. Let's have it. Give all honor. To the Almighty. We just send the Shah Mashi, the only God and the Father. Definitely give the bond to the apostles, the prophets, the managers, the teachers, the elders, the bishops, the deacons across the whole planet. Definitely. Give a shout out to the brothers and sisters. Keep the Almighty's commandments, statues, judgments, precepts, and ways in the trenches, being the light of the world, being the salt of earth, trying to get people to repent from sin, come to this gospel. So, Appreciate the people on the Facebook and YouTube that share, like, subscribe, comment to the videos. Definitely support when we put up the past of the video, the picture, whatnot, a lot of likes and whatnot. Appreciate you guys. I want you guys to make it into the kingdom. Please find a congregation, wherever city or state that may be, find a group of people that's going to love you onto salvation. Definitely. Shout out to you people. So. Wisdom of this world. Wisdom of this world. That's where we left off part one last time. So we're going to finish off with part two. Today, the wisdom of this world. Go ahead and give me First Corinthians. Um, chapter three. But I messed up. With all that said being done, let's let the fingers do the walking. And the stretches do the talking. My voice is in the transition period. Your voice mm -hmm. is not. So, mm -hmm. just because I say that the fingers do the walking, I don't mean you guys got to whisper it. You guys should go hard. You guys got to make up the gap. All right? Let's try that again. So, with all that said, then, let's let the fingers do the walking and the scriptures do the talking. There we go. They sound real monotone. The scriptures do the talking. Anyways. First Corinthians chapter three. Verse eighteen. First Corinthians chapter three, verse eighteen. Some of you people might like me teaching all calm and collected today. <coughs> Let's get it. Let no man deceive you. If you can hear me, let me know online. What's up with uh, Karen? She's on service or can I reach her? All right. Let not, no man deceive himself. If any man among you who seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with the most high for it is written. He taketh the wise in his craftiness. And again, 
the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise and they are vain, they're useless. This is the wisdom of this word, is foolishness with the Lord's heart. So, let's deal with that foolishness. One little cliche, unconditional love. All your love for your kids should be unconditional, it should be unconditional. I've seen this video a while ago. They were talking about if, if your daughter did OnlyFans, would you disown your daughter? And the father said yes. And then all these women on the talk show, it was like a podcast. They were like, oh, they were like, well, you just did. You're supposed to be unconditional love. See, whenever someone pushes unconditional love, they're usually pushing the agenda as you should still support them even in their bad habits. You should still give them unlimited access to you or your benefits that they get despite what actions they produce. And that is not so. Just because if my children go out or my mom go out or my wife go out or whoever goes out and do something, don't mean I have to be in support of that. If, my ch if I don't hang around liars, so if my child grew up and he's 20 and 30 or 40 years old and he's a compulsive liar, I don't want to be around him. I don't be around liars in general. He doesn't get a special pass to lie to me just because he's my son and I got to support him and have unconditional love and, 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 and support. Uh, I want to support him being a stripper or doing this or being a drug dealer. I'm going to support him and unconditional. That, that does not exist. Children can get disowned just like people could get disowned. But the whole unconditional, let's deal with it with the scriptures. Ah, give me a... John chapter 3. Is this what they'll use? Gospel John chapter 3. There. And we're going to start at verse 16. Almighty so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Leave. He so loved the world. His love is unconditional. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn. We're going to deal with condemning a little bit. The next uh, wisdom of this world cliche. But the world through him might be saved. He that believeth in him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he not believed in the name of the only begotten the son of the most high. So it says, God, God loves us. God loves us. And I'm going to show you, his love is not unconditional. <laughs> All right, we got a picture, that's for sure. Anyways, so his love is not unconditional. But let's get with it. Psalms chapter 7. Verse 10. Psalm 7, verse 10. My defense is of the Most High, which saveth the upright. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. He's angry with the wicked every day. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, well, you could be angry with your sons or with your daughters, but that doesn't mean that you don't love them. And that is accurate. This is true. But let's keep going with the scriptures. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Eyes of the Almighty are over the righteous, but his ears are and, and, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Almighty is against them that do evil. He's not hearing your prayers. He's not even hearing the sinner's prayers. He doesn't even hear their prayers. Not even hear them 
up every day. He's not hearing the prayers. They have no access to him. So when they say, oh, it should be unconditional love, essentially, these people that say that, they want to say, oh, if I do OnlyFans, my mother or father should still be there for me. I should still be able to stay the night or borrow money or do this. I should still have full access to them that, as I did before I took on this drug habit or I took on this occupation. Or I, took, I should have full access to my parents as if I didn't do this. No, you don't have that. The only time the Almighty hears a sinner prayer is when they repent. When the sinner asks to deliver them from cancer, when the sinner asks to heal my mom, when the sinner asks for this, this job and whatnot, it says this case is against these sinners' prayers. You do not have access to the Almighty. Except you repent, and you start repenting, then he'll start hearing your prayers. But he don't hear a sinner prayer. Don't be deceived. He has mercy on sinners all the day. It says he makes the sun to rise on the just and unjust. And he sends rain to the thankful and the evil. He still feeds the sinners in hopes that they will repent. But he ain't hearing their prayers. No angel's taking his prayers up. It says give a sacrifice of praise. And our prayers of the righteous is a sweet, swelling Savior unto the Almighty. It's an aroma to the Almighty. So how is your aroma? You are living in sin. And your, what is your aroma smelling like? It's a stench. And he ain't trying to smell that. He ain't trying to hear that. So this unconditional love doesn't make sense. But let's keep going. Give me um, Isaiah 59. Remember, when someone says unconditional love, there's always an agenda behind it. Yeah. Usually because they want to have the liberty to do something that other people disagree with, but still want full benefits and support from the people that, th that disagreed with it. They say it's like it's wrong to disown your kids. They dishonored you. And you do what you want to do. I told you don't do OnlyFans. I told you don't be a drug dealer. I told you don't do this. I told you don't be an assassin. I do this. I'm doing this. And you dishonor me by doing this? You embarrass me? You want to be in pornography and do all this stuff and embarrass me? No. No. I don't want anything to do with you. If you're trying to repent, then let's roll. We could rebuild and we could uh, reconcile. But as long as you're out there, keep it pushing. Keep it pushing. Oh, that's not right. This and this, that. Show me in the Bible that that's not right. Show me in the Bible. And I'm talking about people that say they believe in the Bible and they say, oh, your love should be unconditional. All this. Let's see. Let's see if they get full access to the parents. The Almighty's the Heavenly Father, right? 59 verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot reach. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated me between you and your Yah. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear you. He disowned these people. He gave them the bill of divorcement. He divorced Israel. What happened to that unconditional stuff? Did he come back and reconcile under a new covenant? Yeah. But what, what happened? Israel had to repent to do that. When Amashia came on the scene, they had to repent to do that. But they were disowned and abandoned. He said for 70 years when they sent him to Babylon, he's not going to hear them. He's not going to hear them. On a, on a large scale, individual like Daniel, Meshach, and Benigo, on an individual basis, he dealt with them. But on a large scale of Israel, he was not dealing with Israel as a nation. He disowned these people. That's what we think ability to watch them is. Let's keep going. If I give someone a divorce, do I still say I have ownership or that is my wife or that is my uh, uh, husband? Let me ask that question. If you say, oh, if you give a bill of divorcement, do, if, do you take her, she is part of my family or he is part of my family? No. No. The unconditional love thing doesn't make sense on so many levels. Let's just use a non-biblical level. I got more scripture for you, by the way. For you to even love someone to marry them, don't they have to meet a certain criteria? Our conditions need to be met. We're compatible. They genuinely like me. He cares for me. He protects me. This and this and this. He seems like a good leader. This and this. There, you don't just randomly meet someone and just love them. 
Certain conditions need to be met for you to even love them. So certain conditions could be met for you to not love them, for you to stop when you're growing up in high school and in college or whatever. So long, can you get the door? Oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. Come right. in. So when you're in high school, let's say you're in high school. What are you doing? All right, I'll ask you later. So you have your boy you knew since middle school and high school. Or you have your girls you knew since middle school and high school. You guys knew each other for years. You love your boy. That's my boy. That's my day one. He had my back when we had to get in fights. He had my back. This and this. He didn't snitch. Vice versa. You have your sister. That's your friend. You love, hey, you love that dude. You love that guy, that girl, right? Come to find out that same dude try to get at your girl on the low or try to steal some money from you. That same dude, that same woman try to get at your guy. Get at your guy without you knowing. And you found out. Maybe they did something. Maybe your boy slept with your girl. And you found out about it. Is it unconditional love then? Do you not cut that person off and that same friend became an enemy? But I don't understand. See, this is the wisdom of this world. It says it's foolishness with the Most High. It has never been unconditional love with the Most High. Conditions need to be met. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, there's a condition to that love, ain't it? But let's keep going. Good job, you. Shalom, shalom, sister, shalom, shalom. So, Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, verse 63. Look what he told Israel. Deuteronomy 28, verse 63. And it shall come to pass, as the Almighty rejoice over you, to do you good and multiply you. So the, the Almighty will rejoice over you to destroy you. And to bring you to naught, to bring you to nothing. And for you shall be plucked off the land which thou goest to possess it. <clears throat> now, if it's unconditional love, imagine the creator of all things rejoicing over you to destroy you. It says, just like he rejoiced to bless you. He will rejoice to destroy you. To destroy you. So how does that fit with unconditional love? Please explain that. When I give my kids discipline, spanking, punishment, standards, whatever, right, drills, I don't even rejoice. Sometimes they do something so bad, yes, I do want to give them a spanking. There's a few times, but the majority of the time it's like, I gave you so many warnings, uh, the issue judgment has to come. The Almighty sends prophet, repent, mend your ways. He gave them space to repent. I give my kids space to repent because we are in the Father's stead. They're his children. We're just being in his stead. Hey, I don't do that. That's one number one. I'm telling you, hey, that's my second time. Give me your this. Or you stay home or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. Put them in the room, right? And then... They persist, like they didn't listen to the prophet. Then the Almighty passed judgment, like they went into Babylon for 70 years. Then it's like, okay, apparently these two warnings, you're not getting it. Now i got to pass real judgment on this behavior, right? But I don't rejoice to do it. It doesn't make me happy inflicting harm on my kids so they could come into compliance of the laws of the Almighty and the laws that's in the house, right? So... But the Almighty is stricter than me because he'll rejoice to do you, to destroy you. Whatever happened to this unconditional love, right? Let's keep going. Matthew 25. There. Start at verse 1. Matthew 25, verse 1. Check this out. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, 
I'm gonna deal with you guys on some poly a little bit. Because I've seen this is out today. But I'll deal with it a little bit. Ten virgins, which is took their laps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took the laps and took no oil with them. But the wise oil with their vessels uh, 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 with their laps. So they all knew they were meeting for this marriage. And they all knew the requirements to be met to get married. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered. And at midnight there was a cry made, and the bridegroom cometh, and you shall go out and meet him. And all the virgins, so they were here, trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto them, Give us of your oil, for the, our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went and by, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with them to the marriage. And the door was shut. And afterwards came the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said unto him, Bear that son to you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know not neither day nor hour where the Son of Man cometh. Look at that. Look at that. Where's that unconditional? They got left out. They came to the marriage and they got left out. They would have been married, but they got left out. Where's the unconditional love with that? The conditions wasn't met. They need they need their laps. They needed oil. They need to be virgins. They only met part of the conditions, and then they don't they don't receive that mercy. They don't receive that grace because if it's unconditional, then why are people going to hell? If it's unconditional love, then why do people go to hell? So that lets you just the fact that it's the lake of fire and hell and torment, eternal torment, shows you that love is not unconditional. Because it's internal torment. It's an eternal judgment. That's like me forever giving my kid a whipping. It's an eternal judgment. Why he's sending people to hell then? So if the Almighty doesn't have unconditional love, well, then why should we? And oh, to all you people out here, I wasn't even going to put this. You that fight Polly again. I may have more than wife. Why did he use this as an example in the New Testament? I'm just understanding that concept. Why did he, verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins that took their lap and went to meet the bridegroom. So he was going to marry ten women, right? Why would he use that as an example? Perfect example. Let's, let's back up a little bit, and then I get to the main point. Let's say if someone in their 30s, 20s, 40s comes to me, and I'm on my 30s, 20s, 40s, whatever, right? And they ask me about dating. They ask me about dating, right? And I am against being a pedophile. So they asked me about dating. And so I said, okay, dating, like he says, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins. I said, dating is like unto when you see a 14-year-old girl, she's a freshman, and I'm talking to another grown man. I said, what I usually, what you could do is when you see her walk, when you say, hey, this and this, you love bomb them, give them compliments, maybe buy them some chips and stuff like that. Hey, say, come, this and this. And this is how you get out of 14 year old. Then you'll look at me like, whoa, 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 whoa. Why are you, I asked you about dating, why are you talking about trying to date a 14 year old girl in high school? You a pedophile? You're like, no, I'm not no pedophile. Then why'd you use that as an example? If you're supposedly against being a pedophile, why are you giving me an example of how you get girls or how to get girls? When they're in high school, why would you use that example if you're against that? You understand this concept? So in Matthew, why would the Almighty in his indefinite wisdom, he creates worlds. He creates the sun that we can't even look at it all day. We just got to blind our eyes. He creates all this by speaking his words. Out of all the examples he could have used, he used verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto him. He used a man taking more than one wife. Remember, the poly people say this is sin. You're led by lust. The Almighty's not with the man doing this. This is wrong. You're not of God. But why would he use this example if he's against something? I'm not going to use a, an example of uh, teaching my kids sex by teaching them bestiality and showing them how to sleep with sheep. I'm never going to use that example because I don't go along with that. If he truly doesn't go along with this, from what you guys say... Why would he use this as an example? Please explain that to me. The reason why you can't is because your doctrine is flawed. And I'll prove to you that you just don't, this is just, this is just one example. That's why I don't teach on it, because I will prove that a lot of you people don't even believe in the Bible. This is just one example. Let's keep going. 
Let's deal with this. Oh, one more scripture and we'll give it a shout out. So, give me John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Here we go. Praise the Almighty. Uh, Shalom, Lavina, Yehudim, Occupy, Tommy and Ward. Bear with me. My voice is a little it's in the transition period. So we're at John chapter 3. Once again, we'll go back to that scripture. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right then and there. There's the condition. For God so loved the world that he got his son. But for you to have eternal life. Right? That whosoever believed in him should, should not perish but have eternal life. There's the condition to receive the love. You need to meet the condition. When you go on a date before you love a woman or before you love a man, they have to meet certain criteria. So there is no unconditional, because that means I just love you, I just love every crackhead. Oh, I love you, marry me. They don't meet the conditions to receive your love. For you to have eternal life and to be in his love and get his mercy and his grace. He loved the world that he gave everyone an opportunity, but not everyone's going to receive that. Let's keep going. Verse 17. For God sent his son not to condemn the world, but that through the world and him might be saved. He that believeth in him is not condemned. And condemned is to judge, to declare to be wrong. We will get into this a little bit. Already, because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten son of the most high. And this, verse 19, and this is the condemnation. This is where you get connected. That light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than light because his deeds were evil. This is where you get condemned. A son or a daughter chooses a daughter chooses to do only things. You, she, they love darkness. You tell your son or your daughter, hey, don't do that. Don't sell drugs. Don't game bang this and this. They love darkness. So you don't receive eternal life with the father. You don't get full benefits and full support. Guess what? You go out there, the almighty turns his face and is not hearing your prayers. The Almighty is angry with the wicked every day. Now he's angry with you every day. He's not hearing your prayers. You have no eternal life. You're not meeting the conditions. You follow me with this. The unconditional love cliche. That is the wisdom of this world. Throw that stuff in the truck. Because it sounds good. Doesn't it sound good? Oh, you're supposed to be in your kid's corner and love them unconditionally. And this and this. And no matter what they do. No matter blah, 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 blah. It sounds nice. It sounds nice. But that's the wisdom of the world. If the Almighty doesn't have unconditional love, who am I to have unconditional love? Because it says, A, we have the mind of Amashiach. And it says, B, holy even as I am holy. I'm supposed to imitate him. It says, B, righteous for the Almighty is righteous. I'm supposed to imitate. I, the reason why we are his sons and daughters is because by our behavior, we can see, he can see his characteristics in us. When you have a son that bears your name or when you have a son that looks like the son the image of you, you can say that's my son because he looks like me. So when we live righteous and we live holy and we don't cuss and we don't drink and we don't tell lies and we don't commit adultery, we don't fornicate, we keep the feast days, don't eat pork, right? He sees us. He sees him in us. So if he doesn't have a, 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 a unconditional love and we're supposed to emulate the Holy Father, he needs to see that in us too. Because he's a righteous judge. They're going to be on judge after a shout out. So, let's keep going. Shout outs. Still with some shout outs. Shalom. Is there any other comments? Shalom. Uh, Zora Zion. Praise the Almighty. All the other that came late, I dealt with the wisdom of the world part two. If you haven't seen part one, you want to jump on it. The first part was unconditional love. I think we're going to deal with the next part. But let's do these shout outs real quick. Gia, Karen, Katura, Davin, Munya, Gabriel Gaska, Offer M. Schaefer, Occupant, Claudio Messiah, Israel, Baron Camp, Zura Zion, Joshua Vincent, Bro Vince, Brother Vince, Christine McKay, Christine Cannon, Jamie D'Angelo, Kamari Oreo, Napa Kashet, and Zohara. I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. I want you guys to be saved. Please 
do what it takes to be saved. I'm Teacher Simon. I am not the only one. There are plenty of ministers out there. Please find you some brothers and sisters that's going to love you onto salvation. If they say they're the only ones, then that's an indication they're the only ones that's false. Leave those congregations alone. The gospel does not have a patent, and it's not limited to one camp or one congregation or one movement or one name. Almighty is, is worldwide. So please find those brothers keeping the commandments, living holy, keeping a standard that truly is going to love you unto salvation. So, next cliche. Only God can judge me. Or in Belize, they say, you know, the judger is a sinner. The judger is a sinner. So we're going to do only God can judge me. You guys hear that? They probably pushed that because Tupac pushed that. Hey, um, Kamari, can you give me a small town, please? A small what? A small, small town. Small town for my face. Bear with me. As you can see, my voice ain't the same like normal. So. Oh, only God can judge me. And that sounds right because, man, yeah, that's right. Only God can judge me. Who are you to judge me or who do you... Remember, with every action, there's a reaction. And for every action, there's a narrative or an agenda. So when someone says only God can judge me, that's because they don't want to feel condemnation for their bad behavior. This is like the word snitch. There's no such thing as snitching. Oh, you're a snitch. The people that say a snitch, that the original term of being a snitch is if, let's say, four people were robbing a bank and one of those four people got caught and the other three got away, a snitch will tell on those three so they don't go down by their cell. But he's a snitch because he ratted out. He just happened to get caught. But if I seen a kid get kidnapped and I tell the cops he was in a black car, this and this and this and this, does that make me a snitch because I seen someone kidnap a kid and I told the cops so they can catch the kidnapper and the kidnapper could go to the parents? But they'll be like, oh, don't be no snitch. I'm not doing a crime. I'm not snitching. How am I snitching? And you notice they only want to snitch. They only want to snitch when they're doing bad. I went to a guy talking about no snitch. I said, okay, let me ask you this question. If you're coming late to work and I tell the boss that you be coming late all the time, am I snitching? They're like, yeah, okay. If you come to work and I tell them you're a hard worker and you do clean work, then that makes me a snitch too? Well, uh, well, oh, it's only a snitch if you snitch on me when I'm doing bad. But if you tell me I'm a hard worker and you tell the boss I accolades, then it's not snitching. See, you see the double standard with that? See, that's why I think the Almighty. That's another wisdom of this world. They, they try to, oh, no, don't be no snitch. Man, shut up. It's always the drug dealers or people doing wrong worried about people snitching on them. You can snitch on me because I'm not doing nothing wrong. It's always the wicked and evil people worrying about who's snitching on them. But let's keep going. All right. Matthew chapter 7. Only God can judge me. Verse 1. Judge not. Uh oh. Only God can judge me. That you be not judged. For with the judgment you judge, you shall be judged. Oh, to, to you, uh. Never mind. There's not enough women on here. I have some information for you guys that fight poly. I was going to bring it, but if you guys want to hear it, I'll bring it. I got some paper on it. Judge not that you be not judged. For what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. So, hey, don't be judging people. It's going to come right back to you. Why beholdest thou mote in thy brother's eyes, but consider not the beam in thy own eye? Or how would thou say to thy brother, pull the mote out of your own eye, and behold, there's a beam in your own eye? Thou hypocrite. And that's why I say, oh, the judger is a sinner. I got something for that. But it says, first cast out the beam out of thy own eye. Then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote in thy brother's eye. So he's not saying not to cast out the mote out of your brother's eye. He says you just need to pull the beam out. He never said we can't judge one another. He never. He said just don't be a hypocrite when you do it. You could judge, but don't be a hypocrite when you do it. Don't deal with me on liar if you're an adulterer. Don't deal with me on adulterer if you're an idolater. It says pull the beam out, then go do it. 
So they take the scripture and they run. Like, oh, only God could judge me. No, that's not what it's saying. But let's keep going. Galatians chapter 5. You can bookmark that. We're going to be in Galatians a couple more times. <coughs> Galatians chapter 5. Did you get the rack? Just on the chair behind you. All right, cool. Galatians chapter 5. Are you guys with me? Leave a comment if you guys have a question or something. I appreciate you guys. I want you guys to be saved real stuff. Do what it takes to be saved. Time is winding up. You know they're trying to do this microchip stuff, you know, all this stuff. They're poisoning your food, poisoning the air, trying to put straight some DNA changing stuff in mosquitoes. Hey, listen, hey, it's, it's time to start getting stuff together. No more procrastinating. Do what you need to do to get saved. You need to repent from sin, repent from sin. Quit playing games, get the living out of your heart. Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Oh, actually, 1 Corinthians, sorry. We're going to, you just, we're going to Galatians chapter 5, next scripture. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So uh, bookmark Galatians. We're going to come right back next scripture. First Corinthians chapter 5. There. There. Yeah. 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 Start at verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not you judge them that are within? So we need to be judging people in the congregation. But them that are without, God judges. So this is what I say. Oh, only God could judge me. I got something for you. Don't worry about that. Therefore, put from you of yourselves the wicked person. So, hey, when you see people sinning, we dealt with the little leaven, leaven up the little love. You're supposed to kick them out. And, and to judge is to declare to be wrong. And when you judge, you are condemning a behavior. When I'm judging something, I am condemned. And there's different types of judge or how much you should pay or who's right and who's wrong. But typically, when you pass judgment on someone, you're, you are condemning a behavior when it deals with uh, pull the beam out of your own eye when you have a moat, right? To condemn a behavior, right? So it's to declare to be wrong. So, chapter 6, same book. Dear any of you go a matter to, against one another, go to the law before the unjust and not to the saints. We're not supposed to take other brothers and sisters to the law. Even with the whole divorce thing, I don't see why they go into the courts, why you find child support on dudes or girls. You're going to the law. You should, your congregation should be able to handle that. Going to the sinners to make judgment between two people keeping the commandments. I get you. It says, do you, uh, it says, go to law before the unjust and before this, before this, and not before the saints. The congregation should take care of that. That's why you need a congregation. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Uh oh. I thought only God could judge me. It says that we won't pass judgment on the whole world. The 6.2 billion people on this planet. It says the saints are going to judge that. So what's this only God could judge me garbage coming from? And these are people that say they believe in the Bible. Say that I heard people that believe in the Bible just say that cliche. And if the world shall be judged by you, are you not worthy to judge the smallest matters? Check this out how much we could judge. Verse 4. Uh, uh, know ye not that, uh, that, uh, that, that we shall judge, this verse 3, that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? We're going to pass judgment on these fallen angels. And you want to say only God can judge me? It gets better. Verse 4. If then you are ju uh, have judgment over the things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. It should be the brand new brother. The brother that don't even have time and service. To pass judgment on these small matters. So what do you mean only God could judge me? <clears throat> that makes zero sense. But that sounds right when it's the wisdom of this world. Only God could judge me. Quit listening to Tupac. Tupac was a sinner. I don't care. You know what I'm saying? Quit listening to these sinners. Next scripture. Galatians chapter 5. 
If only God could judge me, then why, why do we have prisons? Why do we have jails? Please explain to me why do we have prisons? No one could judge a murderer even though he killed a whole bunch of people. We can't judge him. We can't declare to be wrong. We can't give sentences, a sentence and, and give a restitution based upon a behavior because only God could judge. We should just let everyone out of prison go. Right? See how much sense that makes? But it sounds real good. Oh, only God could judge me. This and this. The judge is a sinner. Then let everyone out of prison right now. Let them out right now. You know how much sense that'll make? No. Only God can judge me. Let's keep going. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16. This I say then. Walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they are contrary to one another. So you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led of the spirit, you are not under the law, because naturally you are keeping the law, so it has no power over you. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. These are the works. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, sinning, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, fairness, immolation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies. Indians, murder, drunkenness, reviling. And such to which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of the Almighty. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against which there is no law. And they that are of Christ have crucified the flesh and the, and the, and the affections of the lust. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. So we're walking in the Spirit. Keep that in mind. That's my main point for this next scripture. Give me 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians, oh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to start at verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, come up here, Kamari. Why don't you read the scripture for me? You're going to have to read it loud. Why don't you read this loud? Go ahead. Go ahead. Ready? Uh, you guys, let's see. Let's see. Go on, go, go. Hey, I'm in service. Let's do this. All right. Two? All right, I'm going to tell you when to read. Now we have perceived not the spirit of the world. Remember, if we walk in the flesh, we, uh, let us uh, uh, walk in the flesh. We have not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of the Most High. And they which know the things that are freely given unto us of the Most High. Which things also we speak, not of the world's which man's wisdom, but which the Ruha Hagas uh, teaches. Can spare in spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural receiving none of these things of this uh, things of the spirit of the almighty for they are foolishness like the wisdom of this world unto them neither can they know them because they are spiritually discerned you only understand these things if you walk in the spirit right go ahead read verse 15 loud but he that spiritual judges all things some some things all things say it louder all things read that scripture again but he that is spiritual judges all things. Go ahead. Yet is he what? But yet himself is judging of no man. Why no man could judge me? Because I'm keeping the diet. Because I'm keeping the Sabbath. Because I'm keeping the feast day. Because I don't cuss. I don't lie. I don't keep fornication. I don't keep adultery. I don't have graven images. Because I'm keeping. I, no man could judge me. Because why? Because I'm keeping the. That's why I'm judging no man. Because I walk in the spirit. But it says, he that walked in the spirit, what did it judge? A couple of things, what? Judges all things. So how are you going to say only God could judge me when it says, if we walk in the spirit, we judge everything we see? How, how do you get that? How do you make that line up with, how do you say only God could judge me and then make that line up with this scripture right here? But it says, hey, we read in Galatians, it says, if we are led by the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. And we need to be spiritually minded. And once we become spiritually minded, we judge us how many things? All things. Are you? That's all you got. You can go sit down. <coughs> go ahead and give me First John chapter four. First John chapter four. Thank you, Kamari. Yeah. 
there. Verse 1. Beloved, check this out. This is all you all people that don't have a congregation. And I want you to apply that to myself too. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are all of them almighty, because many false prophets have gone into the world. Now this is telling you, don't believe every person. Don't believe every person that wear fringes. Don't believe every person that say shalom. Don't believe every people that put Israel in the back of their name. It says, but try the spirits. Don't believe them. So it says to try them. So once you try them, you're going to come to some level of conclusion. You're going to come after we research this. This is where we land it with this individual. What is that? Another word. What is a synonym for a conclusion? Coming to a conclusion. A judgment. Whether they're up the most high or not. When you watch me, you're seeing, okay, how's this, how's this family? How's this? What does he teach? Is he really living holy? Is there any, he's sleeping with kids at the church. Is he sleeping with the members in the church? You are analyzing not only what I teach, but how I behave to come to some kind of conclusion where I am sent of the most high or not, or I'm a true minister of not. You should, it says, it says, don't believe every spirit. Don't even believe me, but try me. Right, that's for everyone. Everyone is under that rule, right? But for you to do that, you got to come to some kind of conclusion. Because if I say only God could judge me, then, hey, when I sleep with some of the members of the congregation, sleep with my brother or deacon so-and-so's wife, only God could judge me. No matter what I do, I'm still a child of the Most High because only God could judge me. Only God could judge me, right? It says right here, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. You're going to come to your conclusion or come to your judgment. And then you're going to say he is or he is not of the most high. First, uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're almost done. Chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but they are ravening a raven and wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. A man gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistle. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. So you could know when the whole congregation are sin in the campus all leavened up, that's because it started in the head. When there's a whole bunch of people not living holy, not saved at the congregation, that's because the, he's an evil tree. Because if he was a good tree, it says a little leaven, leaven up the whole up. And we just read a scripture that you're supposed to kick these people out. These people really want to live in sin, you kick them out of the congregation. Not because you don't want to welcome them back in, they can come back in if they repent. But the majority of congregation should be living holy, living righteous, because you're not going to let a little leaven leaven up the whole up and sit, cast them out. We just dealt with this. Okay? When I dealt with the Passover, I dealt with the first day of Feast of September, the Feast of Heaven, Love Bread, a couple days ago, right? So it says a good tree cannot produce evil fruit, neither can an evil tree produce good fruit. It says you shall know them by their fruits. So if he's saying there's false prophets, observe what they're doing. After you observe what they're doing, you're going to come to some kind of conclusion, some kind of judgment, some kind of analysis to let you know if they're the most high or not. So, the whole only God can judge me, that's the wisdom of this world. One more scripture. Or two more. Galatians chapter 6. Back in Galatians. There. Starting at verse 1. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fall, you catch your brother in sin. Ye which are spiritual, remember we dealt with spiritual again. And my bad if I'm coming close to the camera, I want to make sure you guys can hear me. Ye that is spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself lest thou be tempted. So when you see your brother got a moat in his eye, and you do not have a beam in your eye, you go to your brother, hey, bro, you, you got to come up higher. You're better than that. 
bro, that's against the most high, man. You're not in the will of the most high doing that. Hey, bro, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. And you're supposed to just store him in the spirit of meekness. So how do you do that if only God can judge him? How do you do that? It says if you see your brother overtaken in the fall, you obviously see he's doing something he's not supposed to do. He's supposed to restore that brother. That way he can repent and get in, in God's good grace, right? Last scripture. First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with the most high. For it is written, He overtaketh the wise and their craftiness. You know, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. Some of these cliches, they sound good. Have you ever had someone try to sell you a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid, a pyramid scheme? Hey, it sounds good. Oh, this is what you do. You got you get in and whatnot, and you got to get two more people in. But once they get two more people in, and they get two more people in, then you get residuals off the first two, and those two get two more. So you got four, you get residuals off of them, and those four get two more people. And now you have four, two, four, six, eight people, plus the four, that's 12, plus the two you got, that's 18. And you're getting a residual income. You're getting passive income. And it sounds good. It does. But the application... It's not working. Only the top 1% of Ponzi schemes actually make money to where they can quit their job. Only the top 1% of any pyramid scheme make money to where they can leave their original job. Keep that in mind. But when they sell it to you, it sounds good. And that's the same thing with the wisdom of this world, these cliches. It sounds real good. So, I'm going to give you guys some information to help out some of you ladies. Because I know... People uh, over the time said I, I go a little bit hard on the ladies. I'm just going to give you some reality. Let me help you guys out today. It'll take five minutes. I want you guys to comment if you disagree or don't disagree. But I'm going to help you guys out. Let's check this out. Even though you think I am being hard on the ladies, keep in mind that women overall typically deflect accountability. Now, bear with me. Society has programmed men and women that women are always the victim. So it's harder, maybe men's fault, it's harder for men, for women to accept that they are the problem than it is for men. Like if there is a divorce, even a man's natural instinct is like, oh, the man must have messed up. Oh, the man must have messed up. The man must have messed up. And that's not always the case. And we know that. But society has trained, especially women, that they are always the victim. All right. So usually when I come a little bit harder, it's because they don't see that they deflect and they gaslight and that they're the problem. Men, we know when we're a loser. If we're 20-something, eating Doritos, playing video games, broke, this and this, society has told us that you're a loser. A woman can be the same condition and she is not a loser. But we'd be in that condition, oh, you're a loser. They, we don't have to tell me I'm a loser, but let's keep going. Ready? I got a couple pages for you guys. I'm going to help you, man, help you women out. Especially the ones that put Israel in the last name and fight. Polly. All right. You guys ready? Let's go with the first one. Women, women outpopulate men. That's the first thing I want to tell you that. So a woman has to compete to get a solid man. There are more women than men, so there has to be some level of competition to get a good man. This is proven. You can look this up. Right? Okay. I'm going to come back to that. 80 percent. 80% of women. Oh, let's go with this one first. 
Here we go. Here's my page. Hope you guys see this. 75% of women will never get married. Keep this in mind. This is Hebrew. You can look this up. Only one out of four women will ever be married. One out of four. Remember that. And that's not including the ones that got married and got married twice or something. Some 75% seventy five percent of men, women, mainly Hebrew women, will never get married. I'm trying to help you out. That's why I go hard on you guys. Seventy two percent, you can look this up, are single parent mothers. Twenty five percent that get married. Out of the twenty five percent that get married. 50% 50, 50 of those 25 don't even make it past five years. So that leaves only 12.5% that get married past five years. And let's just use that 12 point cent and say they, 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 they go all the way until they get old. That means you have an 87.5 chance of you never getting married and dying married. I, I want you women to understand the gravity of this because you guys fought, fight poly and you don't want to share your husband. I want you to understand that you have an 80% chance, 7% chance that you will die alone. You will die alone. These numbers are, are facts. You will die alone. And then you guys fight me, right? You will die alone. But let's keep going. I'm trying to help you guys out. Now, let's go to this one. Let's go to the Pookie and the Ray Race. The Pookie and the Ray Race. Now, 80, almost every woman, your standards, let's deal with the standards. A lot of women want six feet tall, right? Most women will say, oh, I want six feet. Only 8% of the population is six feet tall. So you're ruling out 92% of the candidates. There's already more women than men. And then that criteria alone, you, you're just ruling out 92% of the men. And you have all these statistics against you. I'm telling you, the hardest thing you could ever do in your life, you have a better chance to go into law school and pass in the bar exam. And if you don't know the bar exam, that is the last test for you to be a lawyer. You have a better chance of going to law school right now and passing the bar exam than for you to get married and die married. It is that difficult for you right now. And you guys just don't understand this. And so when I come hard on you guys and you think, oh, this and this, you don't understand. The hardest thing you will ever do in your life is to get married and die married. There will be no other harder thing, not getting your license, not graduating high school, not having kids, not going to college. There is no harder thing you will ever do in your life than to get married and to die married. All right, let's keep going. Fifty-one percent, fifty-one percent, this is your standards. Fifty-one percent of men are childless, of Hebrew men are childless and single. Fifty-one percent, right? But 72 percent of women are single parent mothers. So how is there a 50% men is childless, but 72% of women are single parent mothers? Do you see this discrepancy? The answer is, it's because the 50% that you're going for are the pookies and the ray rays. You're going for the wrong man. Now, remember, 51% 
is, is, is single and childless. 25% of Hebrew men is married. Because remember, when I, only 25% of us is married. So that means 25% of all the Hebrew kids are coming from Pookie and Ray Ray's. Because 50% of Hebrew men are childless and single. So where are all these kids coming from? It's the Pookies and the Ray Rays. You guys are going after the six foot tall Pookie and Ray Ray. And then all the men take the blame and take all oh, man or this or man or trash or man or this. The numbers don't lie. You're not even going after the right man. You're going after hype and you're going after swag and you're going after everything that's not of the most high. And then you get mad at the results. If I go try to marry a crackhead, are we, our man said you can't tell a hoe into a housewife. That's to tell you, man, hey, don't sit, don't do that. that. That cliche came from men to say don't go after the wrong women and think you're going to get a good result. You're, I'm going to get a right result for going after the wrong women. I, I'm going to get mad at this woman. I knew she was a hood chick, and I'm mad at her because she's smoking weed and drinking while pregnant with my son or pregnant with my baby, and I'm getting mad at her. You knew she was a hood chick from the get-go. So you reap what you sow. So, now, even out of this 51%, I'm going to get this drawn out good. Even this 51%, this is Pookie and Ray Ray. This is including the people that's in prison, and this is including the maggots that don't even date women. So your pool is super small. The next study shows that only six out of a thousand people are getting married. The percentage of marriage is dropping. Fewer and fewer men want to get married. They see how the court system works. And so when all these odds are at, at against you, and I say, hey, if you're a single mother, maybe you want to consider being a second wife because it's better for you to have a husband half the time than be a part of that 87% and die alone. But you guys will say, fight me. No, no, this and this. You're led by this and this and this. See, you could fight me, but the men are winning. 87% of you will die alone. So you're holding, you're, you're, you're calling the arms and you're holding, and you're protesting and holding the stats, but you're losing the war because your stats don't equate to a marriage rate. The stats that you believe, and I don't want to share a husband, all that doesn't even equate. At the end of the day, you guys are still dying alone. That pride and ego. So what, what is it at value that you don't want to share a husband and then you 87% of you die alone? How does that avail you? You took that pride to the grave instead of just having a husband half the time. You, and then some of you are going after the Pookies and the Ray Rays. So instead of going after Pookie and Ray Ray, you see this dude that's married. He's been married 10, 15 years. He made it past the five-year mark. So apparently he's doing something right, right? He made it past the eight-year mark. He's doing something right. You see how he is with his kids. You see what kind of house, what kind of car. Oh, that's a solid husband. You just opened up the pool for you. Now you have more options to not die alone. Now, instead of having no father figure or male role model 0% of the time for your kids, you have a male role model half the time for your kids. It's beneficial for you. But then you guys will fight me. But the numbers don't lie. You're dying alone. You're losing your war. Your 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 war. You're losing. You're losing. Eighty-seven percent of you will die alone. You're losing this war. So when I get hard on you guys, yeah, I know because I know I get a lot of feedback. I'm hard on you women. It's because you guys don't see the gravity that a lot of you women serving the Almighty will die alone because you choose to say you you. It's like the six foot. You're only going after 8%. So then, 8% of those men that are six foot, which one of them aren't maggots? Which one of them aren't in prison? Which one of them are Hebrews? See? Down to 2%, 3%, whatever the population. One of them makes enough money, or which one of them is attractive? Which one wants to serve the Almighty? You see how that 8% just drops? And your percentage weight of finding someone that meets this strict criteria just off a of height alone decreases? And you make these requirements that I don't want to share when that's 25% of the population you could actually try to get at. But I'm just going to restrict myself until I die alone. I'm going to make these standards so high or I'm going to restrict myself so much to die alone. 
all these people that fight it, the majority of them are going to die alone. There's some that are fighting that are, are married. Okay, they made the cut. But the majority of them would die alone. So you guys keep fighting a man having more than one. If he could take care of two households, then he probably got it together. I'm not talking about marrying some bum that can't even support one. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you women don't understand the gravity. And you need to be competitive in finding a good guy. If you find a good guy and he's competitive, he may not be six foot. You got to get head on shoulder. He said the almighty. You better try to compete and snatch him up. Some of you guys are only 30 pounds away from being married. Some of you women are 100 pounds. Of, you got good genetics and you don't know it because you want to cover it up at 80 pounds of fat. And you see women lose weight and they look super good once they lose the weight. Some of you women are 80 pounds away from being married. But you don't want to put in the work because now you have to compete for a good man. And rightfully so. Because men have to compete all the time. For me to take you out on a date. For me to take you out on a date, woman. Right? That means I have to have disposable income. That means I need my own place. That means I need a car. That means I need a decent job with extra money past paying all my bills to take you out on a date to get something to eat. And I take you out on a date twice a week. Let's say each date is 50 bucks and that's cheap. So that means I need to have disposable income to spend a hundred bucks on you twice a week until we get married. I gotta do all that just to get your number. Hey, I'd like to take you all out. Just for me to take you out one time. Job, car, old place. See how much work goes into that? For me to be on a competitive scale with a nice woman? You women out, you women, I'm telling you, you got to get it together. Quit fighting what I'm saying. I understand I come hard on you guys, but you guys don't want to take accountability for one's action. Accountability is like your kryptonite. You just deflect and gaslight. No, no. What about what the man doing? Good. You guys master that. I'm not trying to come hard on you guys, but quit deflecting. Take your L's. Take accountability. So, hopefully, that helped you guys out. And I'm going to keep dealing with this. I'm going to put it out where it makes sense. I'll get it easy. Well, I said, Dana, keep standing. Don't stop standing. Get the Almighty hands back. Show them.